my name is Lucas Mann, and I live in Clinton just about 12 minutes from here. And I come out here this afternoon to bring to you the good news of Jesus Christ on the Lord's Day, on Sunday afternoon. Uh, this is the day that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and He set, this side, uh, set aside this day as a holy day. And it's the day on which we ought to worship God. So what a, what a wonderful opportunity for me to come out here this afternoon and to worship God, to proclaim the gospel in the open air. So that's ultimately what I'm doing, is bringing glory to God by proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus Christ had to come into the world to save sinners. Otherwise, we would all go to hell because we have sinned against God, the holy God of glory. But Christ, out of a love for His people, died upon the cross and bought salvation by the shedding of His own blood. He bought redemption. And He was raised on the third day. And the Bible says that every person who comes to Christ in saving faith, in belief upon His name, that Christ receives them to, unto Himself. Jesus said, For the one who comes to Me, I will by no means cast out. We are not to come to Christ as self-righteous Pharisees or people who think that we have something to offer God, but rather coming as poor sinners, as beggars, as thirsty in need of water, as hungry in need of spiritual food. And we look to Christ who Himself is the bread of life. Jesus said in John 10, I am the Good Shepherd. He used many different um, analogies, as it were, and word pictures to describe who He is and what He provides for sinners. It's glorious to contemplate, to dwell upon what Christ offers sinners. Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So likewise this afternoon, I don't come to call the righteous, but sinners. People who are like I once was. I was once lost, but now I'm found. I was once blind, but now I see. I was once dead in sin, but God raised me up to spiritual life in His Son. Therefore, I have a new heart with new desires. I've been born a second time. See, we've all been born once. The evidence of that is because we're alive today. But we've got to be born a second time. We've got to be born again of the Holy Spirit. There's got to be a spiritual birth that takes place in every single one of our lives if we were to see God's kingdom. Jesus said in John 3.3, 3, Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot see spiritual things. He cannot discern the truth from error. You may ask me, Lucas, how is it that there are so many people around the world who hear the gospel, but they reject it? It must be because the gospel is false or the gospel is not very powerful to save. Well, that's not true. It's because they're spiritually blind. It's because they haven't been born again. And that act, that, that act of, of, new, of a new birth in the, in the heart of someone is only wrought by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. It's the work of God in us. Salvation is the work of God in us. It's not a work of man toward God. Rather, it's a work of God toward man. It's gracious condescension on God's part. We know Paul the Apostle, thank you, sir. We know Paul the Apostle said in Ephesians 2 that it is by grace that we are saved through faith. We receive God's riches at Christ's expense by faith. And what is faith? Faith is taking God at His Word. Taking God at His Word, my friends. See, there are many of you out here this afternoon going about your life on the Lord's Day and not caring anything of the things of God. You're like I once was, and therefore headed for destruction, headed for hell. Jesus said most people are on the path to destruction are on the broad path. And that's why there's an urgency with the preaching of the gospel. That's why there's urgency with me coming out here this afternoon. Because souls are at stake. Your eternal destiny is at stake. If I genuinely believe what the Bible says, I'm bound, I'm obligated. I'm a prisoner of the truth, as it were. I'm obligated to tell you the truth of the gospel, the truth of God's Word, so that you might repent and believe. I'm obligated to tell you about God's holiness and God's justice 
and that God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress that truth in their unrighteousness. I come here bringing good news, yes, the good news of Jesus Christ, but also warnings that, there's, there's, that there is hell to pay, there is wrath for those who reject Christ, who reject the God whom they know to exist, whose attributes are shown in the created world, whose glory is revealed in creation. In fact, friends, there's, I like to say there's no such thing as, God bless you, ma'am, there's no such thing as an atheist. I would, I would call myself an A-atheist. I believe there's no such thing. Double negative. Now, why is that? Because God has revealed Himself in creation. He's revealed Himself in this world to each of us, given us a conscience so that we know what is right and what is wrong inherently. But what do we do? We rebel against that which we know to be true. We sin against the God whom we know to exist. And that's why we need forgiveness by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ See, my Lord Jesus, He is a gracious Savior. He is a merciful Lord. And He promises to forgive every person who embraces Him. But see, His forgiveness is not a forgiveness that you receive and then you continue on as you were before. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 9. He said, If anyone is to come after Me, he must deny himself daily and take up his cross and come after Me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. We gain life eternally by denying ourselves in this life, by losing. We gain by losing, as it were, because we're giving it all up for Christ. Jesus himself is the pearl of great price, the most precious and valuable treasure. He is the Lord of righteousness, the King of glory. And He calls, He demands that sinners deny themselves and come after Him. And there's promise in heaven a life of pleasures forevermore and joy in the presence of God and the holy angels in heaven. And friends, this is what I seek to make known this afternoon to plead with you concerning. I'm doing good. How are you, ma'am? Oh. I just want you to know that you are definitely walking in His will right now. Thank you so that very much. People, whether you think people are listening to you or not, you touch me and I have my radio on and I turn around because I heard you saying the Lord's name. And that you're doing exactly what He wants you to do. And we need more people like you out here trying to save people's lives. There's so much negativity going on around you. Mm -hmm. We need more people like you to let people know that God is still real. And He can change people's lives that easily. I mean, things are really bad for me, but I still have faith in God. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, ma'am. Thank you so much. You have a good afternoon. Thank you for saying that. It's a great encouragement to me. Unfortunately, friends, we live in a day where uh, many leaders, even religious leaders, for, for example, like the Pope, they're proclaiming peace, peace. And the Bible says that there are those who will stand up and say peace and safety, but there is no peace. In fact, I just watched a clip the other day of a little boy walked up to the Pope, who is the self-proclaimed head of the Catholic Church, and he said, he asked him, is his father in heaven? And the Pope had no idea who the boy was, who his father was, and he uh, very easily, very quickly told him that his father was in heaven. And uh, the Pope himself has said, you can be an atheist and go to heaven, you really, everybody's going to go to heaven ultimately in the end, in the, according to the Pope's gospel. But friends, that's not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we, must, we have to have a healthy fear of God, a healthy reverential fear, because God is a consuming fire. We know from Deuteronomy 4 that Moses tells the sons and daughters of Israel, he says, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire. He is a jealous God. God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. May the Lord bless you this day. So friends, I plead with you to flee the wrath which is to come. See, back in the Old Testament, we have the story of the flood. 
where God looks upon the earth and sees that the wickedness of man was great and so he flooded the entire earth. Every mountain peak was covered in water. All the animal life was destroyed and only one family, only one man and his sons and their wives were saved. And then they repopulated the earth. What's incredible about that story is the judgment of God that came upon the world. And Noah built that ark for those many, many years, that boat, preparing it for when God's wrath would come and destroy the wicked. And so it is today, my friends. The wrath of God is coming. The countdown has already begun and we are drawing near as each moment passes to the day of judgment. But the ark of salvation, the boat as it were, sits right near to you and I. The Lord Jesus Christ is our ark of salvation. And if we enter into Him, and He in us, if we enter into a covenant with Him, if we come to Him in saving faith, He promises to forgive us of our sins, to make us a part of His people, of His church, of His bride, and to save us from the wrath which is to come. See, we don't come to Jesus for wealth or riches or prosperity or an easy life. We come to Jesus for forgiveness of sin and for a glorious life to come in the next life. We don't live for this world, but for the world which is to come. When you look throughout the, the history of the Christian church, God's people have always been persecuted, burned at the stake, beheaded. They didn't have easy lives, but they knew that in heaven they would be with God. They would see God Himself in heaven. They would be in His presence and that was enough. They wanted God. They didn't want the things of this world. That must be our disposition of heart. We must long for God Himself to be in union with God. Sin has severed the tie, as it were, between God and man. Has, it, sin itself has driven man outside of the Garden of Eden, where he was in harmony with God. But the Lord Jesus Christ brings that tie back. He connects man back with God. There is one mediator between God and man, and it is the man, Jesus Christ, the God-man, the only one who is truly God, truly man, very God, very man, and who could stand between God and man. Because He is both. The passage of Scripture that I would like to highlight this afternoon is found in Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, verse 18, Paul is writing here and he's talking about Abraham. Abraham was a man in the Old Testament who was known for his faith, was known as being a man of faith, a man who trusted God, who believed God's Word. And listen to what he says, verse 18. He says, In hope against hope he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken. So shall your descendants be. Now, God had promised Abraham that he would have a son in his old age, even though he and his wife were always infertile, even when they were young. And to add to it, God told him that when they were older, make it even more impossible for them to have children. And we know that God's promise was fulfilled, that Abraham eventually did have a son, and his son had a son, and his son had many sons. And we know then that the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, was constituted, was made, was set aside unto God. But Abraham believed God. When God gave him that promise, years before Isaac was even born, Abraham believed that God would fulfill His Word. He believed that. And that's what I want to look at. Is that saving faith endures because he endured in hope against hope. Even when the situation seemed hopeless, even when it seemed like God's promise would not be fulfilled, He believed. He stood fast in his faith in God because he realized that God's promise did not hinge upon his performance, but upon God himself who is consistent, who himself is truth and who cannot lie. The promise to Abraham that he would have many descendants so numerous as the sand upon the seashore was a promise that only God could fulfill. And therefore, Abraham knew. He knew that because God is omnipotent, He is all-powerful, that He could fulfill such a promise. 
And so he placed his faith and trust in God. And so must we also place our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ who died upon the cross for the salvation of the world and who offers himself as the most satisfying treasure, as the very way, truth, and life. If we have Christ, we have all. Everything We possess all things. But if you do not have Christ, you have nothing. You could be the richest person on the face of the earth. But if you do not have the Lord Jesus Christ, you are poor, miserable, wretched. But, you, but if you have Christ, though you be poor, though you be afflicted with many trials, you have all things. You have everything that you could possibly need. As I mentioned earlier, the context of this verse, Paul is discussing Abraham and the nature of Abraham's faith because he's wanting to illustrate... God bless you, sir. Thank you. Wanting to illustrate to the readers of Romans what does it look like for someone to have saving faith. He, in fact, he says at the beginning of the chapter, in verse 3, he says, For what does the Scripture say? And he quotes out of Genesis 15, 6. He says, Abraham believed God and, he, and it was credited to him as righteousness. See, Abraham believed God's promise and therefore God credited to Abraham's account a righteousness that was not his own. Namely, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. See, riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. So, uh, Proverbs 4, uh, 11, 4 says, we must have righteousness on the day of judgment before God. And the only way we can get that is by trusting in Jesus Christ because our righteousness is an insufficient righteousness. In fact, the uh, author Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, he says, all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. And the, the Hebrew word there is ida beged, and it means a used minstrel rag. That's how God sees our righteous deeds. Friends, we need a righteousness that is perfect in God's sight, that is unstained, that is pure, that is white as snow, and that righteousness can be given to us. Because Jesus lived a life of perfect obedience. He kept God's law on behalf of sinners. And He gives that righteousness to those who believe upon Him, who rest in that righteousness as their only hope. I love what Paul says at the beginning of Romans. He says in Romans 1.17, speaking of the Gospel, he says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, But the righteous man shall live by faith. We are made righteous in the eyes of God by faith in Jesus Christ. But let's go back to the verse I just read earlier in verse 18. Let's consider that now, the nature, the, the enduring faith that we must have in order to enter into God's kingdom. Verse 18. Paul says, in hope against hope, he believed. Because it wasn't easy. Abraham did not live an easy life. And it took years for this promise that God gave him concerning his having a son to be fulfilled. And we know that even Abraham doubted at times. He even doubted to such an extent that he committed adultery and had an illegitimate son with another woman. We know that that was Ishmael. And he was not the son according to promise. But even then, Abraham continued. Even though he failed, he repented and he turned back to God. And he continued to trust, continued to believe. And then finally, in due time, God fulfilled that promise. And even past Abraham's death. Because Abraham did not see the ultimate fulfillment of that promise. And it's still being fulfilled today. For God is gathering His elect together. He is gathering His people together from around the world, drawing them to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that if we have the faith of Abraham, that we are the sons and daughters of Abraham. Though we may not descend ethnically from Abraham, though we may not be Jewish in our ethnic origin, we are nonetheless the sons and daughters of Abraham if we are of the same faith as he was. If we believe in the same Christ that he believed in. For Abraham surely believed upon Christ. Because the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ was present in the Old Testament period. He says, in hope against hope, he believed so that he might become a father 
of many nations according to that which has been spoken so shall your descendants be as mentioned already it wasn't just about one son it was about many descendants many nations would proceed forth from him and we know that that promise is at this day being fulfilled because God is all powerful God is sovereign everything in the whole created universe is under God's dominion and control is under God's sovereign decree and rule. There's not a maverick molecule in the entire universe. It has all been preordained by God and ordered by God and God disposes all things according to His sovereign will, according to His pleasure. And He works all things for His glory and for the good of His people. That's incredible to know that God controls all things and that He works Him to two ends, ultimately. The good of His people, and even above that, His glory. We, we really could say He works it all to one end, and that is His glory. But to consider that He works all things for the good of His people. Oh dear sinner, if you are outside of Christ today, then you're the enemy of God, and God's wrath abides on you. We know that from John 3. God's anger is against you. And it is only a matter of time before God's wrath will catch up to you. And you will be in hell. Or you can come to Christ and have uh, cast your lot with God's people, as it were. And know that God works all things for your good and His glory. The way of the wicked is treacherous. The way of the wicked is hard. I've seen many people in my life who've lived lives of sin... And even just the look on their face shows that sin, that sin is not easy. Sin is not an easy thing on the body, on the life, on the soul. It destroys. The work of Satan in the unbeliever's life is destruction. Destructive, because God wants the... I mean, excuse me, but Satan wants the wicked destroyed in hell forever. Because he hates God. And we bear God's image. We are bearing the image of God in us. We are made in God's likeness. And therefore Satan hates us. Hates all created men. And he wants them destroyed. And so therefore, God commands all men everywhere to repent. To turn from the dominion of Satan. To turn to Christ. That you might be a part of God's kingdom. And free from the control and manipulation of the evil one. And even free from your own slavery to sin. Because Jesus said in John 8, that everyone who sins is the slave of sin. But if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus set sinners free. Not from financial difficulties, or from health problems, not necessarily. But rather, chiefly, He set sinners free from their sin. And from the punishment of sin. From the guilt of sin. So that they are made right with God. That they are brought into a right standing with the Creator. And this Creator God, of whom I've spoken, He made all things. He made you and I. He made the birds that are in the sky at this very moment and the trees all around us, the grass, the sky that is above, all the cosmological bodies, all the celestial beings, all the angelic hosts God has made. And He made it all for His glory. We know that God created all things in the space of six days and then He said it is all very good. But sin has racked this creation. Sin has brought destruction to the world and to men's souls. But Jesus came to reverse the effects of the fall. To undo the work of the serpent who deceived Adam and Eve in the garden. And to bring an everlasting kingdom. But this God who made the world is a holy God, is a righteous God. 
is a God of great power. I mean, think about the power of God. Think about the power of God as it is as it is manifest, as it is put on display in creation. We think about hurricanes and tornadoes and violent earthquakes. Those are nothing compared to the power of God. They show us how powerful He truly is. Listen to the way Habakkuk writes about the power of God in Habakkuk 3, verse 8. He says, Did the Lord rage against the rivers? Or was your anger against the rivers? Or was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made bare. The rods of chastisement were sworn. You cleaved the earth with his rivers. The mountains saw you and quaked. The downpour of water swept by. The deep uttered forth its voice. It lifted high its hands. Sun and moon stood in their place. They went away at the light of your arrows, at the radiance of your gleaming spear. In indignation you marched through the earth. In anger you trampled the nations. You went forth forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You struck the head of the house of the evil to lay him open from thigh to neck. See, this is God's power. That God is a merciful God and gracious, and He abounds in loving kindness and mercy. We know that from Exodus. We know that from the Psalms. We know that from the New Testament Scriptures. But think about the power that God has. Jesus said, Do not fear those who are able to destroy our bodies but cannot do anything beyond that, who have no power over our own souls. Rather, we ought to fear God who can destroy both body and soul in hell. God has power. And if you are one of His people, if you are one of Christ's sheep, then God has power to protect you to bring you into His kingdom. But if you are one of God's enemies, think about it. God has power at any moment to end your life, to call you, to call you before His throne and to judge you according to your lawless deeds. My friends, God gave His law, His Ten Commandments, which shows us the perfection of His character, how good how glorious He is! He gave His law. The Ten Commandments are found in Exodus 20. When Moses is upon Mount Sinai and, Sinai and God gives him those commands. Things like you shall not lie or steal or commit blasphemy, that is to take God's name and to use it in an irreverential way, in a dishonoring manner. God forbid things like Stealing, thievery, fornication, adultery, idolatry. And when we look at God's law, we see His standard. We see who He is, that He is not a liar or a thief. He's in no way profane or unjust or perverted or malign. He is pure in all His ways, righteous in all His deeds. But what do we see also about ourselves when we look at God's law like a mirror? It shows us how we are covered in filth, how we are covered in the mire of sin, how we ourselves have broken God's law. Ask yourself, have I lied? Have I stolen? Have I committed adultery? Have I blasphemed God's name? Have I used God's name in a way which dishonors Him? If so, you have transgressed the law of God. I know that I have. And we know every person has. Because in the book of Revel uh, excuse me, in the book of Romans, which I'm just preaching out of earlier, in Romans chapter three, listen to the way Paul describes lost man. He says in verse ten of Romans three, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become useless. There is no one who does good, there's not even one. We're not just sick, we're dead in sin. We're not just broken. We're utterly shattered and slaves to sin. Remember what I said earlier? Jesus said that if you sin, you're the slave of sin. This is our state by default. This is what we're born into. We know the psalmist said, David wrote in Psalm 51, that in sin did his mother conceive him. We're conceived in sin. From the moment of our conception, we are utterly 
destitute, poor and miserable and wretched, and in need of grace, in need of forgiveness, in need of salvation from ourselves. And so we've broken God's law, and therefore by default, we stand before Him condemned. We stand before God condemned. And just as a judge here on earth must hold the guilty responsible for their sin, so must God hold the wicked responsible for their sin. He must punish the sinner. What would we think of a judge here in Lawrence County who said to a murderer, you know what, I'm a nice guy, I'm a merciful judge, so I'm just going to let you go. We'd think, we need to get this guy off the bench. He's a criminal, the judge is a criminal. But then we think God is just going to let people go off the hook. My friends, there must be restitution. There must be payment. If that murderer is to be let, ever to be let go, they must pay the due time that is required of them. Let's say it's a 25 year sentence, they've got to pay that. They've got to go to prison for that long because they've broken the law. It's only just when we see that, we say, yes, that's right. They should be sent away to prison. And when we consider God and His justice, people will say, no, God is a loving God, therefore He can't be just. No, God is certainly a loving God and He is a just God. He is gracious, yes, but He is also holy. And His attributes aren't like enemies of each other. They're not like one weighs out, or let's see which one outweighs the other in this certain situation. It's not like that. God is unified. All of His attributes are in glorious unity with one another. And we see them all come together at the cross of Jesus Christ because we see God's mercy revealed in sending His Son into the world, but we also see God's holiness because God sent His Son to bear hell upon His own shoulders so that people, so that sinners would not have to go there. So that Jesus' people would not have to go to hell. Jesus drank their hell. He took upon Himself the wrath of God, even though He was innocent. And so we see at the cross that God can be both gracious and just, merciful and holy. And God didn't do this on a whim, as it were. He had planned this out before the world was made. Before the worlds were created, God had chosen a people to save unto Himself, a people whom He would draw near, a people whom He would bring into everlasting glory with Himself. Listen to the way Paul describes this in Ephesians chapter 1. In verse 3 he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. See, God had planned this out in eternity past. The members of the Trinity, the Father and the Son, entered into an eternal compact, a covenant with one another. The Father had chosen whom He would save, and He gave His Son the commission to come into time and space and to die for that people. And Jesus agreed to do so. Jesus received that charge from His Father in obedience. And so the years passed, the centuries went by, and at the right time, Jesus entered into the world, born of a virgin, born under the law, coming to redeem those who were under the law. And Jesus, throughout that life of 30 years or so, He lived a life of perfect obedience to God's law, something that you and I cannot claim. Have we, for even a split second, obeyed God as we ought to, with 100% pure intentions and motives? No! Everything we do is tainted by sin and rendered useless. Rendered useless in the eyes of God. And so Jesus comes with perfect intent, perfect intentions, perfect motives, perfect execution, and He pleases the Father. Listen to what 
happened in Matthew chapter 3 at the baptism of Jesus. After Jesus comes up out of the water, verse 17 says, And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus pleased the Father. And therefore He fulfilled all righteousness. And then, to speak of the peak of Christ's humiliation, to speak of the, of the climax of His ministry, what does He do? He goes to the cross. And before even going to the cross, before even going to Golgotha, He's beat publicly. His disciples abandoned Him out of fear. He's spat upon. He's made a public mockery. They cannot even find something to charge Him with, but He's killed anyways. He's murdered. Evil men bound the Lord Christ and nailed Him to that tree 2,000 years ago. But that's not what bought salvation for God's people. That's not what secured eternal redemption for the elect. What secured salvation for God's church was this, that upon the cross, Jesus Christ bore the wrath of God. He bore the wrath of God. See, that's what hell is. That's what hell is. God unleashing His wrath upon the wicked. Hell is in a place with the devil where the devil has a pitchfork poking somebody in the back. Satan himself is going to be punished in hell. Hell is a place where God is ruling over that and rendering judgment. He is administering judgment upon His enemies. But Christ upon the cross, being innocent, dies in the place of guilty men and women and bears the wrath of God. And we know that He said upon the cross, to Tetelestai, that is, it is finished. One word in Aramaic, it is finished. It's gone. The debt that God's people had before Him is put away. And their forgiveness is purchased. Isaiah 53.10 says, It says, but the Lord was pleased. God bless you, sir. Thank you so much. You have a good afternoon. Thank you. Isaiah 53.10 says, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. Gone. God's wrath gone for God's people. And three days later, Jesus was raised up from the dead. Jesus was raised to life by the power of God. We know that it was an incredible act of God's providence when Jesus rose from the dead. In fact, we know from Scripture that there was such a, a manifestation of power there on that Sunday morning that it says in Jerusalem that the tombs of many righteous people burst open and they walked out as well. It's incredible. And then 40 days later, Jesus Christ ascended back into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God in heaven. The book of Hebrews puts it this way, that after He had made propitiation for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And there He sits today as Lord and King. As the Lord of righteousness. As the Lord of glory. And the call of the Gospel is that every person repent and believe. Two things. Jesus said in Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's what we are to do. To turn from sin and turn unto God in saving faith. Trusting in His Son. Repentance is at recognizing our frailty, recognizing our spiritual depravity, and our poverty. That we are poor, miserable, and wretched. And turning unto God to save us. And that would be saving faith. Saving faith is taking God at 
His Word, staking our eternity upon God's promises, upon the work of Jesus Christ. And saving faith and repentance are not things that we can muster up within ourselves, not an act of the will, but something that God grants to us so that it is all of God, even though the new covenant, the covenant of grace, is something that is bilateral. That is, it is God and man entering into compact with one another, yet God enables man and gives him the power to even enter into that covenant by faith. So that God gets all the glory. It is all by grace so that God gets the glory. It is not like the Pope says it to be where it is by works and faith. Or like the Jehovah's Witness say or the Mormons say that it is by faith and works. It is by faith alone. Sola fide. In Christ alone. So that God gets the glory. Because God is jealous God is jealous for His own glory. And He will bring glory to him, His own name. He will bring glory to Himself. He certainly will. who repent and believe upon Christ receive the benefits of the new covenant. That is, they receive forgiveness of sin. My friend, you can receive forgiveness of sin today. I have forgiveness of sin because of Jesus Christ, because His blood was shed at Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago. Because the blood of the Redeemer, of God's elect, was spilled. We have redemption offered unto us. Those who repent and believe get forgiveness of sin and the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to them. Imputed means to credit to. To credit something over unto someone else's account. We get the righteousness of Christ given to us so that when God looks at us, He sees total forgiveness. He sees sinlessness. And He sees that we have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So that we are well pleasing in His sight. That's what it means to be justified. To receive the wonderful benefits of justification. It is all by grace. Justification is by grace. And not by works of the law. Jesus takes upon Himself my guilt and I receive His righteousness. He takes upon Himself, as it were, my garment of sin and I get His perfect garment of righteousness to stand before God clothed in. It is all by grace. And for everyone who receives this gift of eternal life from God, they are not only justified forensically, that would be legally, but they are also changed in this life, in time. They are changed on a practical level. They have new hearts with new desires. That's what it means to be regenerated, to be born again. When someone is saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, they no longer want to live the way they lived before. They walk in a new manner of life. They love the things of God and they hate the things that pertain to the things of the world and sin and selfishness and sexual immorality and drunkenness and idolatry. They love God. God has shed abroad His love in their hearts. He has enabled them to love their neighbor and to love, themsel uh, to love God and to love them na their neighbors as themselves. It's radical. When God saves a man or a woman, it's radical. They have radical life change. In fact, friends, I would say that if, if you say that you're a Christian but you don't have this, you're not a Christian. If your life has not been radically changed by the power of the Gospel. Because what did Paul say in Romans 16? Or Romans 1, 16, excuse me. He said, I am not ashamed of the Gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. It's the power of God. If God is all-powerful and His power is manifested in the Gospel, is, is vested in the Gospel, 
and you believe it and there's no power in your life, there's no power to overcome sin, there's no power to turn from the things of the world, there's no power to put to death drunkenness and drug abuse and pride and selfishness and addiction to pornography, then it is because the grace of God is not manifest in your life because it was never there in the first place. You can say that you're a Christian, but there are many who say they're Christians and they go to hell and they already have gone to hell. What did Jesus say in Matthew 7? Many will say to me on the day of judgment, Lord, Lord. And He says, I will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. They knew Him to be Lord. They knew Him to be the King of glory. But they were hypocrites. I was a hypocrite for years. I said I was a Christian, but I was lost. I had prayed the prayer. I'd been baptized. I went to church. I read my Bible sometimes. But you know what? I was living a life of sin and I didn't care at all. I didn't care about Christ. I didn't care about prayer or the Word of God. I didn't care about following after God. I didn't care about God. See, God saves us unto Himself that we might commune with Him, that we might be in communion with God. And if you say you're a Christian but you don't long for that, it's because you're not. And so I exhort you to examine yourselves, to examine your lives in light of Scripture and to see whether your profession of faith in Jesus is a legitimate profession or whether your profession of faith is an illegitimate profession and you're deceived. For there are many who are deceiving themselves even at this very moment upon the face of the earth. And this gospel, the gospel of grace is not only for um, the lost, but it is for Christians to dwell upon to preach unto themselves and to others daily. Because it's powerful to encourage God's people just as it is powerful to save sinners from their sin. And so if you're a Christian, I exhort you to meditate upon the Gospel and to share it. To share it with those who are around you. Because it is the most glorious good news you will ever hear in your life. It is the good tidings. It is the UN Gelion. The good news. It saves souls and it glorifies God to proclaim the gospel. It is all by grace. All by grace. And what is grace? Grace is favor apart from merit. It is when God shows an ungodly man or woman a wretch grace. When He forgives them of their sin because of the work of His Son and wraps them in His perfect eternal righteousness that's grace. And that's the grace that's manifested in the Gospel. That's the grace that's put on display in the Gospel. And it is all to one end. The glory of God. That's, that's the point. That's the end of this. That's the end of all things. That's why you and me have been created, friend. We, we've been created with a purpose. And the purpose is this. To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's the end to which we are to live. That's the end to which we've been made. All things, the whole world, the whole universe, it's not meaningless. It's not pointless. It has a point. And the point is this, the glory of God. To bring God glory. It pleased Him to make this world. It pleased Him to create you and I. And it even pleased Him in His sovereignty to bring me out here today. My friends, I plead with you to give God the glory. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Thank you. To give God the glory for the great things He has done. What does Paul say in Romans 11? For from Him and to Him and through Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. All things are to Him and for Him and by Him. And so to God be the glory. To the one true God. There is only one God. And He is the triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in His being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. So to Him be glory. Amen. I exhort you, if you are lost, to come to Christ and be saved from your sin. If you say you're a Christian, examine yourself to see whether that profession is true. And if you are a Christian, I exhort you, 
to meditate upon the glories of the gospel and to proclaim it to those who are around you by God's grace and to God's glory. So we've seen here in Romans chapter 4, verse 18, that Abraham, a man of faith, believed God even when it was difficult. In hope against hope he believed. And so must we also believe God's promises with diligence and with perseverance. Believing that, that though God is holy and we are sinners and we deserve hell, that Jesus died upon the cross and rose again. And all who believe Him are saved by His grace and to His glory. And so I say to Christ be glory, honor, praise, adoration forevermore. Amen and amen.